Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Our Lady of Lourdes. Would you please stand and join in singing Be Thou My Vision, which you can find on your yellow song sheets. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom, and thou my true Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. In tonight's gospel, Jesus shares a parable to illustrate the immense love that God has for us, for the times that we've rejected that love and are turning away from him. Let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mystery. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done, what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary of a Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O God, who through your word reconciled the human race to yourself in a wonderful way, Grant, we pray, that with prompt devotion and eager faith, the Christian people may hasten toward the solemn celebrations to come. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have removed the reproach of Egypt from you. While the Israelites were encamped at Gilal on the plains of Jericho, they celebrated the Passover. On the evening of the 14th of the month, on the day after the Passover, they ate of the produce of the land in the form of unleavened cakes and parched grain. On that day, after the Passover, on which they ate the produce of the land, the manna ceased. No longer was there manna for the Israelites, who that year ate of the yield of the land of Canaan. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Taste and see 
the goodness of the Lord. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be ever in my mouth. Let my soul glory in the Lord. The lovely will hear me and be glad. Taste and see the goodness of the Glorify the Lord with me. Let us together extol his name. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Look to him that you may be radiant with joy, and your faces may not blush with shame. When the afflicted man called out, the Lord heard, and from all his distress, he saved him. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And all this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ, as if God were appealing to, through us. We implore you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who did not know sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. I am the light of the world, says the Lord. Whoever follows me will have the light of life. Praise, Praise to, to you, you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. My brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke.
Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them, Jesus addressed this parable. A man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. And after a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat, but here am I dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father still caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, quickly, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. Now the older son had been out in the field, and on his way back, as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, Your brother has returned, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf, because he has him back safe and sound. He became angry, and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, Look, all these years I served you, and not once did I disobey your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughtered the fattened calf. He said to him, My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. In recent years, a greater number of parents than perhaps at any other time prior would agree that one of the biggest contributors to their stress The biggest threats to their sanity comes from one source, Disney. Specifically, Disney's animated movies. Now, this wasn't the case for decades. Being born in 1973, Disney's new releases were few and far between. Just looking at the the list of animated films on Wikipedia, I only remembered Pete's Dragon from my time growing up. Some older movies, which may have been re-released in theaters or showed up on television, were definitely family favorites, especially like Jungle Book or 101 Dalmatians, but I don't remember even them being an ever-present part of our lives with books and toys 
and I don't even remember any of the songs from those, those movies. But even being a celibate priest of 22 years now with no children of my own, that cartoon factory has found a way to torture even me with their recent films. They start out as creative and enjoyable the first 25 times you hear and see them, but as they become these phenomenons with streaming services, practically entire industries based on one film, what was cute and catchy becomes something closer to a Chinese water torture. And that started for me in college with Lion King and Pocahontas. You would see and hear those songs played all the time, and it was somewhat mildly to somewhat annoying. But nothing compares to this current era, where I'm guessing I can unsettle a great number of people with just three words. Let it go. Oh yes, that power anthem, Let It Go, from the 2013 movie Frozen, can reduce some people to convulsions. Having three nieces who were almost eight, four, and two when Frozen first was released, and then a year older when it was on video streaming services and stuff, it was an education of what parents have to go through. My three nieces, that might have been the last time they were ever united in enjoying something. And my mother's great hopes or her Italian curse that my oldest brother would be tortured as he tortured her as growing up has been paid back in ways I could never have imagined. Of course, she helped by buying the youngest a dress that every time she pushed a button would light up and just play, let it go, let it go. That's all a disclaimer for tonight's homily, to get all that out of everyone's head. Because at the risk of triggering many people, those three words keep coming back to mind, praying with these scriptures. Let it go. These scriptures are all talking about transformation that God is trying to bring about, reminding us the newness that deep within we long for in our lives is possible, and the healing of all that is broken can happen when we let it go. But what is the it? Looking at the scriptures, it is actually a bunch of things. So I had to laugh in the first reading from Joshua. There's a specific it that the men experienced, namely they had all just been circumcised. So what was that all about? Well, the people of Israel had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and they were unable to enter the land that God had promised them. That 40 years had just ended and one of the last things to happen for this new day to dawn, when finally that reproach of Egypt was removed from them, was when the men were circumcised. They finally fulfilled that part of the covenant that the people of Israel had made with God, but had not honored while they were in the wilderness. But to be sure, that was just one outward expression of what was happening spiritually, internally, among all those people for those four long decades. The reason that they wandered so long was despite God unleashing 10 dramatic plagues on all of Egypt for enslaving his people until the Pharaoh would let them go. Despite God parting the Red Sea for them to march forward to freedom and then unparting the Red Sea on the Egyptian forces chasing after them, eliminating that threat from ever re-emerging. Despite his promises being fulfilled time and time again, and just asking his people to reciprocate in trust and in faithfulness, they would constantly come up short. And it would take these 40 years of wandering in the wilderness to learn how to let it go. The it being their unfaithfulness, their doubts, their overthinking and overcomplicating things, their hesitations, their fears, And once they have, once they let it go, all those things, we hear the joy that comes as as we read in the first reading. They finally made it to this long promised homeland. They're celebrating the Passover, this great celebration of God's deliverance. They were no longer eating manna, that mysterious bread that God had provided to sustain them that had gotten a bit boring at this point to eat every day for 40 years. But now we're feasting on on the produce of the land, the land that God had promised them, and they were experiencing fulfillment. But we can't lose sight of the fact that the delay for that fulfillment was completely the people's fault. God is always faithful to his promises, but he's waiting for us to believe that and to trust that 
and to live as people who are faithful to him and him alone. And the fact that the people would end up losing this promised land, would end up being enslaved again, and not just by foreign enemies and ruthless leaders, but worse to the devil himself, as they would end up enslaved to sin, that was a result of them reverting back to some of the things they had just let go of and starting to cling to once again. Humanity would start to rely on themselves, put their faith and trust in themselves, and the things of creation rather than the loving creator. They would slowly move to treat God as this disinterested bystander who they would try to appease on surface level affection in their worship, minimal observance of their laws, constantly making loopholes to his commandments, and then find themselves lost and divided and desperately in need of a savior. Yet as Jesus arrives on the scene, we see time and again, they fail to recognize God incarnate. They fail to accept him as he tries once again to call his people to recognize their, their narrow visions, their misinterpretations of scriptures, the, the limitations they put not just on God himself, but who they were and who they were supposed to be. Jesus is constantly trying to capture their hearts and minds to these obstacles and calling them to let it go. And this gospel is another example of Jesus trying to do just that. This is possibly the most well-known parable in all the scriptures, which has often been mistitled as the prodigal son. Why mistitled? Because that's too narrow a description of the story, and it makes us put all the focus on the one son, which if we let that happen, we can find ourselves falling into some messed up thinking, just like the oldest one, who's only interested in comparing and contrasting himself with his brother. And in the process, you miss the one character that deserves the attention, and that's the father. I had a relative, every time this gospel came up, would file that recurrence in her mind to tell me the next time she saw me that she didn't think it was right. She agreed with the older son, and she, who she described as the faithful one. And she would give me examples of how unfair it was. She had to go to Mass every Sunday, and then someone makes a deathbed confession as she puts it, could skate right into heaven. And in my early years of priesthood, I would debate her about how she was missing the point. I tried to point out disagreeing with Jesus isn't a good spot to be in. And some years after, I just, I tired of arguing and just kind of disengaged from it, which saddens me in retrospect now as she's passed on. She didn't realize that she didn't just agree with the older child in the story. She had become him which is truly sad, because if we do that, we miss the joy of being God's beloved sons and daughters here and now. We can miss the truth of what it means to be saved, what it means to be known, what it means to be loved by our Father. Because as bad as it is that this younger kid disses his father saying, he can't wait for the old man to die and he wants his inheritance now, which is basically what he was saying. And then he gets it and then completely blows it on sinful living. What's equally troubling is what you realize that the older son has been just going through the motions. He's saying and doing the right things, but he doesn't know the gift that both he and his brother shared with their loving father. The older son doesn't even realize how angry and resentful he's grown in his heart to his brother and his father. It's almost like he's envious that the younger guy had the nerve to get his share when he did. And now that it seemed like karma was a real thing after all and the younger brother has made a complete mess, is desperate and sheepishly comes home, he loses it that the father is just going to welcome him back, that the father still loves him. It never crosses the older brother's mind that the father's heart was broken at what the younger son had done. He's just as self-centered as the other guy, and worse, he's oblivious to it. It shouldn't be called the, the prodigal son, and I don't even think it should be called the ungrateful children. The point that Jesus wants us to focus on is the lavishly loving, merciful father. Because it's when the younger son 
lets go of his pride, lets go of his arrogance, lets go of his sinfulness, and humbly just comes back, that he's finally able to see the depth of love that the Father has for him. For the older son, will he let go of his pride? Will he let go of his arrogance and his resentment? Will he recognize how he's only had a surface level of respect for his father? Will he experience the love and the mercy and the reconciliation that the father sees as the greatest of gifts that he wants all of his sons to enjoy? It depends on whether he will ever let it go. What is the it for you today? The it that you need to let go of. The thing that's causing tension or isolation from God or from others. These readings are coming at a pivotal time for us. We're just over the halfway point of Lent. And maybe the hopes and promises that you intended on Ash Wednesday have become distant hopes and forgotten promises. Or maybe you've been able to be faithful to all those calls to fast and to pray and to give, but have grown frustrated as you compare what you're doing to what others haven't been. Maybe you've just lost a sense of the why or the who you're ultimately doing all these things for, and you can find yourself relating to the older brother. Or maybe it's a mix of both. Whatever it is, wherever it is we find ourselves, ultimately what matters is that we're here. We are in the Father's house. With three weeks to go, we're to focus on that truth that St. Paul reminds us of in that second reading today. That because we've been baptized, we are already new creations. The old has passed away. But history tells us we can find ourselves like the people of Israel, reverting back to those old things and old ways, choosing to enslave ourselves by grasping on to fears or doubts, overthinking, giving in to temptations, or even just ignoring sins that we're one confession away from being forgiven of? Are we going to make changes and live this new life of Christ or revert back to those old ways? The loving Father sent his only son, Jesus, and poured out his Holy Spirit on us so we would find it's easy to let it go and then to know and be known and to love and be loved by him alone. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages. Uh, From God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men, for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified who has spoken to the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins and look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. <laughs> Let us look to our Savior Jesus Christ and pray. That the church and her missionaries may be seen more clearly as a sign of God's mer- mercy. We pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those discerning a vocation to the religious life and priesthood, that they may hear God's voice with clarity, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For the intercession of Our Lady of Lords, for healing and strength for all those who suffer in illness, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. 
for countries affected by violence throughout the world, and for peaceful resolution for the nation of Ukraine and all displaced people, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For our beloved deceased, Vincenzo Russo, Philip Lachance, Rocco Petrillo, Eleanor Shannon, and for all whom we remember in our parish book of life, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For the intention of this Mass, for the internal rest of Helen and Walter Sumniski, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, hear these prayers and those we keep in the silence of our hearts. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. There are two collections today. The second collection is for our Easter flowers. And as always, we thank you for your generosity. us, Lord, into the desert. Lead us, Lord, the wilderness. Through this journey we will follow, for we long to see your face. In this time of sacred struggle, in this time of sacrifice, we rejoice for we remember that we lead us into We 
bless your holy name, receiving love, we give our lives away. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. We place before you with joy these offerings which bring eternal remedy, O Lord, praying that we may both faithfully revere them and present them to you as is fitting for the salvation of all the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just that we should give you thanks and praise, O God, Almighty Father, for all you do in this world through our Lord Jesus Christ. For though the human race is divided by dissension and discord, then we know that by testing us you change our hearts to prepare them for reconciliation. Even more, by your Spirit you move human hearts, that enemies may speak to each other again. Adversaries join hands, and peoples seek to meet together. By the working of your power, it comes about, O Lord, that hatred is overcome by love, that revenge gives way to forgiveness, that discord is changed to mutual respect. Therefore, as we give you ceaseless thanks with the choirs of heaven, we cry out to your majesty on earth, and without end, we acclaim. You, therefore, Almighty Father, we bless through Jesus Christ, your Son, who comes in your name. He himself is the word that brings salvation, the hand you extend to sinners, the way by which your peace is offered to us. When we ourselves had turned away from you on account of our sins, you brought us back to be reconciled, O Lord, so that, converted at last to you, we might love one another through your Son, whom for our sake you handed over to death. And now, celebrating the reconciliation Christ has brought us, we entreat you, sanctify these gifts by the outpouring of your Spirit, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, whose command we fulfill when we celebrate these mysteries. For when about to give his life to set us free, as he reclined at supper, he himself took bread into his hands, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, on that same evening, he took the chalice of blessing in his hands, confessing your mercy, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
the mystery of faith. Death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until we come again. Celebrating, therefore, the memorial of the death and resurrection of your Son, who left us this pledge of his love, we offer you what you have bestowed on us, the sacrifice of perfect reconciliation. Holy Father, we humbly beseech you to accept us also together with your Son, and in this saving banquet to graciously endow us with his very Spirit, who takes away everything that estranges us from one another. May you make your church a sign of unity and an instrument of your peace among all people, and may you keep us in communion with Francis our Pope, Joseph our Bishop, and all the bishops in your entire people. Just as you have gathered us now at the table of your Son, so also bring us together with the glorious Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and all the saints, with our brothers and sisters and those of every race and tongue who have died in your friendship. Bring us to share with them the unending banquet of unity in the new heaven and the new earth, where the fullness of your peace will shine forth in Christ Jesus our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it is not a temptation. Deliver us. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress. As we wait the blessed hope, the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's offer each other a sign of peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace, grant Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy of the nation that you have my Only say the word of my soul.
but one body, one cup, one call, one faith, one spirit, presence in our soul, one prayer, one blessing. One peace, one church, one people, one love released. Is not this bread we share, the body of our Lord? Not this wine we drink, the blood of Christ outpoured. One bread, one body, one cup, one call, one faith, one spirit. Present in our soul, one prayer, one blessing, one hope, one peace, one church, one people, one love, really. Let us pray. O oh God, who enlighten everyone who comes into this world, illuminate our hearts, we pray, with the splendor of your grace, that we may always ponder what is worthy and pleasing to your majesty, and love you in all sincerity, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bow down for the blessing. Look upon those who call to you, O Lord, and sustain the weak. Give life by your unfailing light to those who walk in the shadow of death. And bring those rescued by your mercy from every evil to reach the highest good. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is in. As we go forth, please join in singing number 517 in your hymnal. Praise to you, O Christ our Savior. Praise to you, O Christ our Savior, word of the Father, 
calling us to life. Son of God, who leaves us to freedom, glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You are the word who calls us out of darkness. You are the word who leads us into light. You are the word who brings us through the desert. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, O Christ, our Savior, word of the Father, calling us to life. Son of God, who leads us to freedom, glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ.